Welcome. My name is Mario Vitale, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my friends Jocelyn, Bra Jocelyn Brad, and Jesse, and today we're talking about cooking in Piemonte. And not only just cooking, but the sweet cooking of Piemonte. The city of Torino is a famous banking city, and when there's rich people around, all they want to do is eat desserts. So today's show is called Ugly But Good for one of the most famous cookies of all of Italy, called Brutti Ma Boni. The first one, however, we're going to make is something called Baci di Dama, the kisses of a lady. It's very simple to make. <laughs> Desserts have never been my forte, but they're very easy to make and they're very simple as long as you buy the best ingredients and treat everything with just a little bit of a slow respect. You can't kind of jimmy it a little in the saute pan like a lot of the times I do. It's something that has to follow a certain kind of a recipe breakdown and everything in the right format. So you can't really wing it as much as you can. So follow the recipe as closely as you can. Three quarters of a cup of almonds. One cup of sugar. We're going to add a cup and a half of flour and the whole thing is going to take place in the food processor. And you're like, well, do they generally make this by hand? Well, of course they do, but they've got 45 hours and we don't. So we're going to make this into a little cookie batter by just blending the whole thing. Basically, the idea when you're doing something in the food processor is as quickly without melting the butter, blending the butter to be completely surrounded by all the rest of those ingredients. And in Why fact, do you want to melt it? if you melt it, it changes its entire property and behaves radically different. It melted butter is something that just doesn't, when you're trying to catch the breath of it holding, what you're dealing with when you're trying to make things that are baked is often enough the water is being either somehow trapped or reacted upon by the fat. Now there's no water in here except for the fat or that which is in the butter. So that you want to do is if you melted it, it would completely change what's holding or whatever air component in there is no longer there. Is it if that makes butter? sense. Uh, this is unsalted butter, and I almost use exclusively unsalted butter because if you're salting the butter, you're probably hiding some of the imperfections or age, for that matter, lack of quality. Now, to make that, you just bring it together like so, and you don't want to overmix this, or what happens when you overmix cookie doughs or cake doughs or co cake batters, if they get blended too much, they develop a certain toughness. And whenever you've, if you've ever made muffins around the house, you know that the best way to do that is just barely bring those ingredients together so that you don't challenge it and it becomes chewy and uncool. So there's your basic cookie form. It's easy to do. I've made a couple here in advance so that I can do this as quickly as possible without causing any trouble. And what you do is you just take that little tablespoon there and you pop them on. So all I've done here is just lightly oiled it with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil or you could use butter, you could use margarine, you could use the spray stuff. It doesn't really make a difference. The key is that they're all about the same size because eventually we're going to make these into sandwiches. So now you've got your oven at 350. Cookies don't take too long, about 10 to 12 minutes. So we're going to toss these in until they've just set or turned light brown. Then take them out and allow them to cool. In which case, they look like this. <laughs> Rarely do we do that on this show. But I felt like we had to do it because I wanted to get something done. Now what you've done is you've allowed them to cool because it's important. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take some basic melted chocolate. Could be a candy bar, could be the fancy Kaya Bow, whatever. Does Torino have a special kind of chocolate? No, Torino use? doesn't. They use, actually the French Kaya Bow is the one that they're most famous for. But now more and more all the trendy guys are starting to use this uh, chocolate from Hawaii. This gold coin or something like that. But is that bittersweet? Yes, bittersweet is what I like. Milk chocolate's good, but I like bittersweet better. So now what you do is you just put a little bit of that chocolate on top there. And there you have it. You've made yourself one fancy sandwich. Do that a couple more times. And basically, there you have it. Now to serve them, oops, oops, oops. To serve them, you want to let them completely cool. Because as they've melted the chocolate, as we saw right there, if you've melted the chocolate, it's not going to hold on to those cookies like we'd like it to. Now one of the tricks that I've always liked before serving cookies is you spank the sugar over the top of it. I like it too. And it gives you what you want. Go ahead and have one, guys. Right. Leave that one though because he's still warm. Pass him around, get Jesse one. And there you have it, Bachi di Dama, or the Lady's Kisses. Just like a lady's kiss. Just like a lady's kiss. Delicious, <laughs> magnificent. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to Strangely enough, we're going to sift for one of the first times on this show. We're going to take a whole mess of spices. We're going to make something called bicholana, which are these beautiful kind of biscotti-like cookies from Vercelli. And they're very spiced. And this is something that kind of represents also the riches. When you talk about the influence of a rich society, spicing is one of the things that was always associated with riches because they had to go all the way to the Asia or to the Seychelles or something to bring these spices back. So the use of them prominently, particularly in desserts but also in savory courses, represents there's a lot of wealth. And when you think about that, Rome, Venice, 
and the Piemonte, Milano, being in Lombardia, but Torino, having all that money is where they really kind of express that. So we're going to take coriander, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, coriander again, <laughs> and we're going to sift them all together, and we're going to just get them all well mixed, because basically you want them to be completely and thoroughly mixed throughout. Sifting something that I've always had issues with, but I've decided to give it a shot with this one here so that we can really distribute those dry ingredients around. Then what you want to do is get the rest of your flour in there, and that was about two and a half cups, a cup of sugar, and eight tablespoons, or one stick, of butter. What we're going to do at that point is now just toss it in the old blender here, or the mixer as it were, and we just want to batter that or beat it until it's light and fluffy. That's to say probably four to five minutes. So we'll get this started when we come back. I'll show you how we finish these beet shaloni and then start up with the brutti mabuoni, the ugly ones, and little tarts made of ricotta. So please stay with us. Hey, welcome back. Now, what we've got here is a dough. What I did while you were gone is I added two egg yolks and two eggs. What that does is makes everything a little bit softer and it's gonna make the extra crunch on this variation on biscotti to be even firmer. So now what you wanna do is you wanna take it and you just wanna roll it into somewhat loggy looking dowels and then pat them down like so and do the same with the other. You can see the incredible spiciness representing the wealth of all of Torino. <laughs> just sitting there looking good, right? Then what you do is you just take them like that, cut them across, lay them on a floured and dusted, I mean, a uh, oiled and flour dusted pan, and bake them. Now, biscotti comes from the word cooking twice. It's the past participle of cooked, cotto or cotti, and bis, which means twice in all the, your, all the languages except for English. So that means we're going to cook them twice. We're going to cook them at first 350 until they just about set, which is where we're at with this group here. Then we're going to lower the heat. Ooh. How long at 350 do you cook them for? 350 you cook for about 20 minutes yeah. until it just starts to look a little bit like a cookie, like these. And then when they're still warm, what you have to do is you take your knife and you just start to cut them like this. Because at this point, if you didn't cut them while they were warm, they would eventually set and be very cookie-like. Now, that doesn't mean it's not good warm, guys. Here, go ahead. Everyone gets a culo. There you go, nice. one and one and one. And then what you just want to do is, depending on the size that you want them to look like, you cut them a little bit on the bias and as thick as you want. I don't like them too thick. I like them just like so. Now, it's pretty good already. I mean, it's kind of like cookie dough ice cream or whatever. It's still a little rare. You can see in the center, it's still kind of not fully cooked through. You can really taste the spices in these. Well, that's right. And when it, when it will become even more evident by the time it's cooked that second time. Because as it starts to dry out, what it really leaves behind is the intensity of that spice mix. So then you take them like so. You've lowered your temperature by 100 degrees down to 250. And that's what's going to kind of dehydrate or dry these out. Now, for my money, I like cookies that are really crispy, really crunchy, actually, quite hard, because we like to serve them with a little bit of a red wine and just dipping. If they're too soft or they're too crumbly, he got no game. <laughs> Could you make the dough in advance and freeze it? Yes, you can, absolutely, and then bake it to the order. Or one of the things about these is that once they've been cooked that second time, literally a six-month shelf life. They're not going to... The worst thing they're going to do is get crisper or crunchier or harder or whatever, and that is not a problem. Now, that's still hot. So now we put it in our lowered oven. A lot of times what you'll do is you'll just kind of leave the door jam just a little bit further open if you can. I wasn't so successful in that. <laughs> now, the next thing we're going to make is an interesting pastry dough to make our little tartalette. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some warm water and some wine, and we're going to use yeast. 
A lot of people are frightened of this stuff. This is brewer's yeast. Comes crumbly, it looks like it's just gonna fall apart. As long as you don't treat it wrong, it'll treat you right. The trick with yeast is making sure that this warm liquid is warm enough to activate it, that is to say, what we call blood temperature, somewhere in the 90s or the low 100s. Over 110, what would probably happen with this is it would die in which case then it's not gonna do anything. Under about 75 or 80, it never gets activated, in which case it's not gonna do anything. But it's not that hard to get something between like 85 and 110, right, so? Is that yeah. yeast different than the one that you, that you get in packages? No, they, they all work the same. This is just a different form. Right. And they all work the same way that you have to have that temperature control right. or it's a disaster. So now what you wanna do when you have yeast is you wanna feed it something, and it loves the idea of sugar, and hates the idea of too much heat initially. So we're gonna give it a little honey, a little extra virgin olive oil, and a good pinch of salt. What's the difference between normal olive oil and extra virgin? It seems like it's everything. the way they press it. The first pressing, when you get olive oil, olives, you bring in this giant harvest, and you bring in this whole thing, and you press the first ones without doing anything to them. The second time, they heat them up a little bit. The third time, they heat them up a lot. The fourth time, they take this mass, and they heat it up even more. That's the fifth pressing, or just regular olive oil. The very first pressing is extra virgin olive oil, and it's uh, measured in an acidity. It has 0.5 degrees of acidity, or how would you measure acidity? 0.5% of acidity that uh, below that is extra virgin olive oil. As you heat it up and start to mess with it, it starts to mess around. So there you have it. Extra virgin olive oil is the only thing you need. You do not need to buy any other olive oil, in my opinion, even for deep frying. If you've ever been to Rome, the reason that the artichokes taste so good there is because they're fried in extra virgin olive oil. And although people think, well, their high smoking point of, the low smoking point of extra virgin olive oil causes it to burn or taste burnt, it doesn't taste burnt in Rome, guys. I gotta tell you, it's absolutely <laughs> perfect. They know how to do it. So now what I've got here is I've got basically what you would consider a sponge. At this point, you could make it a bread or anything like that. We're going to make this into a beautiful little tartlet dough. And I'm going to take another cup and create what... Eh, I'm going to take another cup and a half. Let's go wild. And I'm going to mix this around, and then I'm going to knead it to make it look just like a bread dough. And in fact, that's what we're going to have. So when we come back, I'll have kneaded this for a while and allowed it to rest, in which case it's going to start to rise a little bit. And then we'll deal with these beautiful little tartelette di ricotta. So please, stay with us. Good Eats and Unwrapped make your nighttime pop with pop culture and pop science. We've pulled the pin on an edible hand grenade. Your nighttime fun starts right here. Good Eats and Unwrapped, weeknights starting at 7, 6 central on Food Network. Hello, welcome back. Now, to make the filling for these beautiful tartelette di ricotta, I've taken an egg yolk, two egg yolks for that matter, and a half a cup of sugar, and I've blended it to make something that looks very much like this. That is to say, just whisk, 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 whisk. Then what you want to do is you want to take a little bit of milk. Now this is milk that I've heated up, but it's nowhere near boiling. It's probably at about 175. And we're going to temper them by adding just a little bit of the milk there. And the reason that you temper stuff like this, ladies and gentlemen, is so that the yolks won't break into scrambled eggs by being heated too quickly. What we're really doing is we're trying to create something a little bit smoother and a little bit more viscous, kind of like a custard. So now what we're going to do is we're going to dump that egg yolk sugar mixture back in. And what we've done by taking out the insurance policy <laughs> is we're now not going to break this unless we really mess it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to cook this, constantly stirring it, just for about a minute. You want to bring it up to up, up and around 210, 205, just under the boiling point. In which case then, and if I'm whisking it properly, it'll stay up a little bit like a zabaglione. We like that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it off. Now we're going to let that cool for a minute. Then I'm going to mix that with some ricotta and make this beautiful dessert. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our dough, which rose, just like so. How long did that rise for? 45 minutes in a slightly warmed room, perhaps one like your very kitchen. 
<laughs> it could rise more quickly, and one of the things about yeast doughs is that you have to be careful to watch them because sometimes they won't rise. You want to put them in a room about 80 degrees. If you had a proofing box, you would use that. If you have a regular household, if you put it on the back of the stove while the stove's on but not blasting, that's probably the best place. Will you but, get any hints from the smell? Yes, well, it smells good. It won't tell you if it's gone wrong. It won't start <laughs> smelling bad. It just won't smell at all. Yeah. If something's gone awry, you wouldn't know. I mean, you wouldn't be able to create poison or anything that's any, going to hurt anybody here. The worst case scenario is here that you didn't activate your yeast or you over-activated and killed your yeast. And you would be able to tell because it wouldn't puff up. That still wouldn't create an entire disaster. You could still make this. It just wouldn't have a beautiful leavening to it. It would just be kind of flat lifeless, you know, like a bad hair day it would be. So now we're going to roll that out to about an eighth of an inch thick, kind of looking like biscuits there. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to do something called blind baking. That's right. We're not talking about someone who can't see, we're talking about baking something before you're going to use it that second time. And what you do is you'll pack it into either a little tartlet shell like so, or you might pack it into a large tart shell. But the whole trick is that you want to cook this so that it's crisp, so that whenever you put whatever the filling is, in which case we're going to use this beautiful ricotta, you want to make sure that that doesn't just make this into a whole soggy mess. If we were to take these, put the ricotta stuff in there, cook them, first of all, the ricotta stuff would dry out. But second of all, because the ricotta stuff is wet and in contact with this dough that is very susceptible to its dough softening tricks, then you might have some issues. So what we do <laughs> is we do a blind bake. And what a blind bake implies is that we take this and we convince it that there's something in it by taking little sheets of this parchment paper and going like so, right? And then taking something that we know we're not gonna burn, like dried beans, huh? You with me? We're patting them in there. The breeze from the Torino is coming across <laughs> the plains here at the station. Here we are up here in Vercelli. So it's the Torinese breeze that might have come from over the mountains, over the Alps. Do you use wax paper or any sort of paper or just? Stick with the parchment, will you, Brad? Come on. <laughs> you could use just about you could use newspaper. Yeah. It would be very cool to use the Gazzetta dello Sport, the pink newspaper that they use for sports. Anyway, you put these on, you put them on a cookie sheet, you throw them in the oven, you bake them for 12 to 15 minutes, and they come out nice and crisp. Not unlike our biscotti or a bisolani, which are now done. Now, the trick with these is they're still going to be soft, when you take, go ahead, take them. Careful, it's a hot pan. But just take one or two. Now, they're soft now, but in five minutes, when we're totally done, you're going to be surprised at how crunchy they've gotten. So these are going to taste a lot like they did that first time. What we want to do is now get these guys in the oven so that we can bake them. And when they come back, we're going to let them cool just a little bit. But then you're going to see how we stuff them, fill them, and then have a party. So please, when we come back, I'll show you how to fill these babies up and get them all going. Don't go away now, you hear? Hey, welcome back. Now, what I've done is I've blind baked these guys and I've allowed them to cool with the beans on. And now we're going to take them off like so and just set them up. Now, they already look kind of cool, right? Yes. This is something you know we've spent some time on. Now, I'm going to take that liquid, the milk with the eggs and the lemon and the sugar, and I'm going to mix that with some fresh ricotta. I'm going to say I'm going to mix it with even more fresh ricotta because I want it to be really more about the ricotta than anything else. The lemon is just kind of a little holding pattern for it. Now it's starting to look a little bit like it's broken. It isn't. It's just exactly what you want. Then I'm going to take some raisins. Now I've taken these raisins. I've soaked them overnight 
in white wine with a little bit of sugar. Wow. But you could soak them with red wine, you could soak them with grape, you could soak them with whatever. The idea is that you want to plump them because dried raisins, when you toss them into a ricotta like this, suddenly become something too much to chew. But if they've been soaked like now that, they're really moist. now they're moist and succulent, mm -hmm. bursting with all of the energy of this side of the Alps. Then what you want to do is you just load them in with a spoon. So now you've got that beautiful crispness going on. And you want to, well, the mistake I just made was to take them out of there. There we go. You want to take them out of their little sarcophagus first and just spoon that stuff in there. Now, the trick with these, very much like the trick with good cannoli, is you can't make these three hours in advance because what's going to happen is the moisture of that ricotta is going to wreck the whole game. But we do want it to be a little soaked in. We want it to have somewhat... You know, enough softness so that this doesn't just break into a thousand pieces when you go. Do a lot of Italian desserts use cheese? A lot of them particularly love ricotta because ricotta is such an amazing and delicious thing. Now to serve them, we just spank them over that. And there you have it. The tartalette di ricotta. Our beautiful dessert show is also with these brutti ma buoni, these ugly little kind of meringue things. I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you guys for being here and I look forward to seeing you on the next Ultimario. Ciao.